engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good evening. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson, and it's Friday here at Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. The phone number is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. I want to begin with this emergency declaration nonsense uh, and whether or not it actually happens. And I I do, by the way, I, I intentionally do use nonsense. I'm not trying to be flippant here. There are real problems with the president's use of a declaration of emergency. The first thing you need to understand about with a declaration of emergency is that it really is more of a creative way to surrender so that the president can blame judges. In fact, uh, people on Capitol Hill and in the White House are saying this as much, that if the president reopens the government and declares an emergency to fund the border wall, what's actually happening is the president and his team know that federal judges will issue an injunction and prohibit him from doing what he wants to do, and then he can blame the judges and reopen the government. So the government gets reopened and the president doesn't get his wall. Another issue with the emergency declaration is there are a lot of armchair pundits out there saying who would have standing, who would have standing. Well, if you actually read the National Emergencies Act, uh, it was written in 1976. It was signed by Gerald Ford. It's not clear that the president could use a declaration of emergency and mobilize soldiers to build a wall in the United States. That's one of the things being um, floated. The reason for this is because the there are statutes that prohibit the use of soldiers on American soil, uh, except in very limited cases that have to do not with national emergencies, but with times of war. Uh, if the president is summoning the National Guard to do something like that, the, there's problems. Now, there's a difference between actually just defending the border as the president summoned National Guard troops to do and sent them to the border before the election, and actually physically building structures across private property in the United States, which is what would be proposed. Very problematic legally for the president to be able to do this. Uh, Farmers would have standing to sue if their land was being taken or there was an ingress and egress by soldiers on their property. States would be able to sue if the president was declaring a national emergency in their areas. And now one of the issues being floated is that the president could reassign emergency money allocated for natural disasters in Florida, Georgia, Texas, and California, and direct that money to be built on the border. The states would have standing to sue on that issue. Uh, Lots of people would have standing to oppose this in court. It would get dragged out even if the president were potentially successful. It could stretch beyond six years so he could go through another term, finish off this term, and have another president still dealing with the issue. And if that president's a Democrat, kill it. Uh, Another issue here is the precedent that would be set. You know, presidents of the United States follow precedents going all the way back to George Washington. Still, to this day, presidents use precedent set by George Washington. The reason Bob Mueller is having a hard time getting the president to testify and possibly even charging the president is because there are a series of president's administrations and justice departments and White House counsels who have set precedent that a sitting president cannot be charged with a crime. That's why Mueller is having to move so cautiously. These precedents matter. If the president were to declare a precedent by declaring an emergency and spending money, all presidents have declared emergencies under the National Emergencies Act. Barack Obama declared them. Donald Trump has declared them. George W. Bush declared them. Bill Clinton declared them. Every president has declared emergencies. What sets Donald Trump's emergency apart is that if you look at all the prior emergencies, short of natural disaster emergencies... All of the emergencies deal with foreign affairs or national security issues, not a wall, and they don't reallocate or reprogram federal tax dollars to spend domestically. They deal with putting holds on other people and making it harder for people to do business. This would be a very unique emergency declaration in that the president is declaring a national security emergency with money to be spent domestically on a purpose that Congress has refrained specifically from spending. On top of that, another thing that would make the emergency very unique is that this is an emergency that has been dealt with by prior presidents, and the situation has arguably improved over time, and we've never had a president declaring something an emergency when the trend line suggests it's been improving. As a matter of fact, illegal immigration is down. Uh, Cross-border drug trading is down. All of these things, it's still high, still higher than I want. This is why I support a physical wall. But the data does not suggest it's classified as an emergency when the situation year over year has improved. 
All of these things suggest if the president is doing this, it's not a conservative option. On top of that, it's an option that expands the power of the government to spend money and sets precedents for future progressive presidents. That's not a wise thing for President Trump to do. But beyond all of that, if you really, really, really want a wall, and I do, that's why I support the government shutdown. That's why I think the president should continue the government shutdown until the Democrats compromise. Then the issue here is that declaring a national emergency, reopening the government, and then using the emergency to reprogram tax dollars to build the wall, you're not going to get the wall. A federal judge is going to stop President Trump if he does this. Farmers will sue for the government taking their land. States will sue for the reprogrammed dollar. States will sue for the president declaring a national emergency and summoning National Guard troops or putting soldiers on private land to build the wall. Lots of people are going to sue and keep this tied up in court. If the president does the national emergency route, what he's doing is he's surrendering and doing so creatively enough to find someone else to blame. You know and I know that most of the president's supporters, if he does this, they're going to rush out. They're going to blame the federal courts. They're going to totally ignore the fact that everyone has said this uh, courts are going to stop this. There is a way for the president to get his wall built. So what does the president do to fund the wall? A national emergency declaration isn't going to get it done. So what does he do? Well, see through the shutdown. It is painful. And the media is in the pocket of the Democrats. The media is in a situation where they're pushing the Democratic talking points and they're highlighting all the tragedies. They're highlighting people who lose their employment benefits because they're federal employees in ways they would never highlight the tragedies of people being killed by illegal immigrants. But keep it going. Democrats, did you, did, if you were listening to the first hour of Sean Hannity's show, Democratic congressmen are talking about the phone calls into their offices are overwhelmingly in favor of building the wall. Keep it going. Keep it going. At some point, Democrats realize they have to reopen the government. And the president can hop a plane and he can barnstorm the country, going to the congressional districts of these newly elected Democrats, these newly elected Democrats who beat Republicans in areas that Republicans tend to hold and point out that he's willing to compromise on the issue. He, even if it's to upgrade existing walls and add border patrol agents, he's willing to compromise on the issue. But he wants to at least make upgrades on the walls, if not expand the wall. And show that Nancy Pelosi is the one who's unreasonably failing to compromise. Show the public that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are the ones saying no, 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 no. Show the public that Nancy Pelosi is being unreasonable. Bypass the national media. Go straight to the voters. Go to the voters on the campaign trail. Go to the voters through local media that tends to be more conservative than the national media. Go sit with local reporters in areas where there have been influxes of illegal immigration and give them the actual stats, give them the actual data. Make the case on local media around the country. Push through on that, Mr. President. And you can win the shutdown fight. You can get your wall. But going the national emergency route isn't going to do it. It's going to get a federal judge to tell you no. It's going to tie it up in litigation. It's going to give you someone to blame for surrendering so that you don't have to take blame for surrendering, but it's what you're doing is you'll be surrendering. You'll be walking away from ever getting the wall, and that's something the president's supporters need to understand. If the president declares a national emergency and reopens the federal government and then reprograms money saying, we've got an emergency, I'm going to, remove, I'm going to move money around in the budget to build the wall, that building of the wall, it's never going to happen. The only way at this point for the wall to be built is to win the shutdown fight, not surrender the shutdown fight. And the only way to win the shutdown fight is to get an Air Force One and fly around the country and start making the case to voters in these swing districts that the Democrats are being unreasonable, the Democrats are refusing to compromise, the Democrats are the ones who don't want to secure the border, the Democrats instead want to get rid of ICE. In fact, if I were the president, I would bring up Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who went on CNBC, along with other Democrats who said they want to get rid of ICE. Make that the case. The reason the Democrats don't want to fund the borders, they want to get rid of border enforcement altogether. Make that case around the country. The president and his team are doing a terrible job. The media is out to get them. The media is on the side of the Democrats. And the one thing the president can do is go be above and beyond all of them. Go to local reporters and local areas and local voters and they're not doing that. They need to do that. A national emergency would be a surrender.
and the president's team knows it. And in addition to it being a surrender, it would be a terrible precedent set for other presidents. You know the difference between climate change and illegal immigration? The Pentagon has declared climate change a national security issue. The ground is already laid for a national emergency there in a way that illegal immigration isn't. And for all of you who are saying, well, the Democrats are going to do it anyway, well, first of all, that's an elementary school playground argument. Um, But Barack Obama never did this. Never did this. Barack Obama did a lot of things unilaterally, and even Barack Obama didn't think he could do an emergency order on stuff like this. You're paving the way with bad precedent, and the future Democrat will take advantage of it if you do. But you know what? If the president does all of this blustering, saying, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and then comes out and says, you know what? Turns out I don't have the power to do it as president. As president, Well, then he's solidly establishing a precedent that future presidents, including progressive ones, won't be able to ignore. It is 26 after the hour. The phone number is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. To the phones, we're going to go, let's go to Danny in Flowery Branch. Welcome, Danny. How are you? Hey, Eric. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, sure. Listen, I just wanted to say that I absolutely agree with you. Um, I thought you would have gotten to this point uh, in this conclusion yesterday, but Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi are sitting back licking their chops right now praying that he declares a national emergency because the moment that he does it is checkmate they go back to their base say that we stopped him and he is going to have this gummed up in the courts forever and finally thrown out by judges in the same way that he tried to to go with daca and that stuff was injunctioned also that's why he can't even use that as as a as a um as a negotiating tactic right now so if he declares if he goes and declares a national emergency it's game over yeah, very much so. I mean, the president is going to be stopped by federal judges. You know, I've had several several Trump supporters uh, come at me today on social media say, no, no, uh, this is national emergency. They can't stop him. Uh, the president has the power to restrict immigration to this country from uh, countries around the world for national security issues. And judges put an injunction on him over that. Uh, successfully. That is absolutely right. And the moment that he goes to Texas and starts trying to call eminent domain and taking people's property to build a wall, it, it's pandemonium then. Yeah, it is. And, and here's the other thing people miss uh, under the National um, National Emergency Act. It does not specifically authorize eminent domain. And there's Supreme Court precedents going back to 1827, where in order for a president to implement eminent domain, the statute under which he's uh, using it has to specifically authorize it. There is no statute in the National Emergency Act that allows for eminent domain to be used. So the president would give up his eminent domain powers if he doesn't go through Congress the regular way. Absolutely. And I would say, I would say that he uh, the, the old saying is that you shouldn't pull out a gun unless you intend to shoot it. And I think he's pulled out the gun. And if he does shoot it, it's game over. Yeah, I think so. Danny, thanks very much for this. Uh, the only way to win this fight, the only way to win this fight is to engage in the shutdown politics. He's addressed the nation. He's gone to Texas. Now go around the nation and do interviews with local media in areas where Democrats picked up seats. Come to Atlanta. Do an interview with WSB-TV uh, targeting Lucy McBath's district. Go to Pennsylvania. Target all the districts up there around Pittsburgh. They voted for the president, then they turned Democrat. Go go up there and remind the voters why they voted Republican in 2016 after having voted for Barack Obama twice. Go to Texas. Go to New Mexico. Go to Arizona. Go around the country to these districts and campaign And remind the voters that you're willing to compromise, but we need upgrades to the border. We need more immigration judges. Uh, The Democrats agree with this. We need more Border Patrol agents. Democrats agree with that. We need more Customs and Immigration Enforcement agents. We need the Democrats agree with that, except for the fringe. Take the fringe like the media does to the Republicans. Take the fringe and say, look, the Democrats want to abolish ICE. Make them deny it. The president's not waging an effective campaign. He needs to wage an effective campaign in the shutdown, and he's getting bad advice. People who are willing to take a cop out knowing he'll lose the fight. He needs to not declare the emergency.
It's 39 after the hour. It is Eric Erickson here. I have a text from a friend of mine who is in the House Freedom Caucus um, telling me essentially to to <laughs> stop pointing my guns in their direction. Uh, the His text is, yes, publicly, we're standing behind the president. Don't want to make him angry while we are behind the scenes telling him an emergency declaration would actually not be a good idea. There you have it. A uh, member of the House Freedom Caucus saying publicly they are supporting the president. They don't want to get the president's dander up in their direction. So they're showing loyalty on camera. But behind the scenes, they are advising him not to go with the government shutdown or not to rather not to go with an emergency declaration. Uh, so because they understand the implications. Hallelujah. I, I'm actually kind of stunned by the amount of bad advice the president is getting on this from people who simply don't care. And, and one of the arguments I'm getting from a ton of people is that um, the Democrats would do it if they're in charge. Might as well go on and do it. But I think Barack Obama is kind of the uh, the dog that didn't bark, so to speak. Um. Barack Obama used executive power almost exclusively to enact his agenda. And Barack Obama was desperate to get a climate change agreement. And even he, he, he did an executive uh, agreement. He didn't take it to Congress because he knew the Senate wouldn't ratify it. But even he didn't declare an emergency. Barack Obama did not abuse the emergency declaration power in a way that some of Donald Trump's friends are encouraging him to do it. And a future president, if this White House concluded that the president was capable of declaring an emergency to get this sort of stuff done, future presidents would use the precedent. Even if a federal judge, and this is the important thing to understand, even if a federal judge enjoined this president's emergency doesn't mean that a future judge would enjoin the next president. I mean, I can see a progressive judge agreeing. I mean, for God's sakes, you had a progressive um, Democratic judge allow the lawsuit to go forward with the kids that were suing the government over climate change. It got stopped ultimately, but a judge let it go forward. I can see a federal judge letting a climate change emergency declaration go forward if the president concludes it's possible. But if this president looks at it and says, you know what, it's not possible for the president to do an emergency declaration in the, in these areas, then that actually is really good precedent that would prohibit the next progressive president. Now, I, I, I realize when all of this is over, there are going to be Trump supporters out there saying, see, 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 this was actually all an elaborate trap to restrain the presidency. And hey, if you want to believe that, that's fine. I will let you believe that, but it's not true. We should keep facts and keep things grounded. And, you know, I still think crowdfunding is the way to go. I'm perfectly happy to write a check to help. Uh, And I suspect the president has 60 some odd million supporters. A, A significant number of them would be willing to cough up money to help. I think it could be done. 404-872-0750-1800, WSB Talk. There is other news out there, but I want to take your phone calls as well. Let's go with John from Lawrenceville. Welcome, John. Hey, Eric. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? Good. I had a question. So with the government being shut down and them basically saying that the government's going to be shut down, this will be the longest one, um, what are going to be the consequences like long-term about – I think I heard somewhere that the like food stamps and EBT cards are funded all the way through February – if we were to stay closed that long, like what would be the consequences? So it, longer term, uh, everything begins to shut down. Congress has been funding itself not with budgets but with continuing resolutions, and they've broken them up by divisions of government. So if the government – right now it's, it's a handful of agencies. The number of agencies that are shut down grows if they can't come to terms with this agreement. Uh, If those grow, then you are at some point going to start looking at uh, losses of of supposed critical services by the federal government. States will be able to step up in in some areas and some parts of the government won't close down. So, for example, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, the majority of its budget is controlled by fees uh, that are attached to your tickets. Uh, So they would arguably be able to keep funding by and large. 
but there would probably be a reduction of services because not everything with the FAA is funded that way. Uh, it, ultimately, you would get to the point if food stamps were not funded by the end of February, well, then the food stamp program is not going to get funded and a bunch of people wouldn't be able to buy groceries unless uh, others step forward. I have to admit that one of the side reasons that I support government shutdowns is so that, one, people realize that life's not going to immediately end. There seems to be this democratic perception that the moment the government shuts down, everybody's going to die, and that's not true. But another thing is I, I really hope at some point people will be mindful of the fact that we've become too dependent on the government and really should return to having local communities taking care of themselves. Instead of having everybody in your local community dependent on federal government food programs, uh, learn how to go to church and become a member of a church and have churches take care of each other or other charitable groups. It doesn't have to be a church, uh, but... we have all become so beholden to the federal government for our daily existence. And I think having the shutdown and having people think, you know what, government could fail us again. Maybe we should invest in our local communities and build local institutions to be able to take care of ourselves instead of being dependent on the federal government. I think ultimately long-term that's a good thing. And I realize a lot of people disagree with me on that. That's perfectly fine. But I think people are too dependent on the federal government for so many things. And this is, a good way to help people rethink, do we really want to stay dependent on the federal government for all of this stuff? Uh, Six in Norcross, you're next. Welcome. Hey, Eric. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I was, okay, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Freeze. Six. Real yeah. name? Nickname? What? Real name. Really? Okay. Yes, that's sir. An S-I-X. Yes, sir. You, you you had the same question for me last time. And you had my real that, is, that is awesome. That That is totally awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Do you have a brother or sister named Seven? I do not, no. Okay. All right. All right. I'll let you go. Listen, people always ask me. My first name is Eric Woods, and people always ask, and, or like Eric Erickson. I actually had a woman at Kroger one time. I kid you not. I was buying beer at Kroger when I was in, in law school, and I had to show the woman my driver's license. And she literally, I apologize if anyone is offended by this word, but the cashier looks at me and says, Eric Erickson, your mama must have been retarded. She actually said that to me. <laughs> said no it's my wow. dad's name too okay so i digress from names to your point sorry six <laughs> no no problem I, I was just quickly wanting to ask you uh, at, you know we're tied up on this whole federal situation but uh, at, at the state level and i'm mostly referring to texas what can cruise i mean in trump we obviously have cruise support there what what can we uh, individual states do um to, to kind of get the wall started or get or set up the initiative um, or what can I guess more specifically what can Cruz do uh, if, if Texas were to set up the uh, were to kind of get the ball rolling on the wall well it, it's hard for them to do in that uh, border security is explicitly a federal role constitutional role um, I certainly do think that the states could put up barriers or could uh, Governor Abbott in Texas, for example, could send more more Border Patrol agents, Texas agents there. Um, but, you know, th- there is something that conservatives have to come to terms with, and that is that uh, the border wall actually isn't that popular in Texas um, because right. Texas is a state that puts high priority on land rights. And New Mexico and Arizona, a lot of the land along the border is federal parkland, but uh, 90% of the border land in Texas is private property. And even, for example, Rick Perry wanted to build a Trans-Pacific Highway that would have taken land from farmers in the Rio Grande Valley and wound up having to scrap plans for that highway that would have gone into Mexico because farmers were so opposed to having their land taken for it. Uh, I, I don't think that Republicans outside of Texas really genuinely understand just how opposed to the border wall uh, people are in Texas. Um, and it, it has everything to do with Texas private property rights. It is a really big deal down there, and they don't want the wall. But the federal government, Donald Trump, he does. It is 56 after the hour. The phone number 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. Um, back to the phones to Seth and Gainesville. Welcome. Hey, um, I just wanted to see what your what's your prediction on how this will end. 
the shutdown? Oh, man, I, I am no prophet. Um, if I had to guess, it would be Republicans in Congress selling out the president and voting with the Democrats to override a veto. That would be my guess. Um, yeah. my, my fallback from that is that the president will cut a deal with the Democrats to boost the number of immigration judges and the number of border patrol agents and get money to fix the existing portions of the wall, um, with a prohibition on using it for new portions of the wall. Um, I think at this point the white house would love to get that deal. Uh, but the Democrats genuinely want to break the president on this. They, they want him to look weak to his um, supporters. They know that many of his supporters understand that a, a, an emergency declaration will help the next progressive president and that they're not inclined to support that. So they want to break the president here. They, they want to score points against the president and make him look weak. And so the president's going to have to wait this out. Now, remember, it was the president of the United States who said he was going to shut down the government, and they want him to own it now. Uh, he should have never done that, but he did. So now he's got to own it, and he needs to stick with it. Uh, in the next hour, uh, the inauguration is on Monday. I will be the master of ceremonies for Brian Kemp's inauguration in Atlanta. I've, I've got kind of a play-by-play of the day. If you want to be able to observe anything, uh, I'll give you that when we come back. There's also news of Stacey Abrams and her plans. She's been in Washington meeting with Chuck Schumer and others about possibly running against David Perdue. I will tell you what I know. Also, there is a real serious threat of freezing rain this weekend. We will have our weather center open, of course. Keep your cell phones charged so you can get the WSB Storm Center updates uh, via the WSB radio app. And also, at 7 o'clock tonight, uh, we got a special program here. Clark Howard has been out uh, in Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show and he's going to have all the information, reviews, and updates with all the cutting-edge technology at 7 o'clock tonight. After the hour, I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News. The phone number is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Freezing rain is coming in, folks, uh, so you got to be real careful out there over the weekend and stick with us. Make sure to charge your cell phone. Uh, so you can at least get weather through the WSB radio app. Also, at 7 o'clock tonight, Clark Howard is going to do an in-depth dive at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, all the hot technology trends that are out there. You're not going to want to miss that. Some really fascinating news to come out of there, including some really big 4 and 8K even flat-screen TVs of reasonable price. I'm, I'm, I don't have a 4K TV. I'm thinking I want one. Can't afford one right now, though. Okay. We got to move into the news of the day. Stacey Abrams is being recruited to challenge David Perdue. John Ossoff, remember him? He wants to see Stacey Abrams challenge David Perdue. Teachers unions as well are pushing very, very hard to get her to challenge David Perdue. Uh, David Perdue, behind the scenes, uh, there are some Republicans who worry about Perdue in that um, they don't feel like Michelle Nunn gave him the fight of his life last time he ran. And they they want him to make sure he steps up his game this time. I personally think Purdue can handle it. Uh, I do think, however, that he and the state party need to just camp out in the Atlanta suburbs and really rebuild relationships there, reach out there. Um, it, building relationships really is one of the keys. But uh, Abrams, according to Greg Bluestein at the AJC, uh, she met with Senate Democrats this week to discuss the 2020 challenge. She met with Chuck Schumer, uh, Cortez Masto, who heads the Democratic Senatorial Committee, and uh, they're recruiting her very hard to run. Now, she says that she has three criteria to make the decision. One is she says she needs to run for office um, because she's decided she's the best person for the job, not just because the the job is open. Two, she needs to run because she's got the ideas and capacity to win the election and do the job well. And three, she needs to make decisions not based on animus or bitterness or sadness, but really based in pragmatism that this is the right thing to do. 
Now, some of her closest allies, according to Greg Bluestein, believe she's more likely to wait and run for governor against Brian Kemp again because her focus is on state-based issues. But she is being recruited heavily to run against Purdue. Uh, we will see. She's got a lot of national figures pushing her in that direction and she says she's given herself until March to make up her mind. Now, I want to give you guys an overview of Monday. Monday is the inauguration for Brian Kemp. It is uh, Governor Deal, uh, his tenure in office, his two terms comes to an end. The state legislature also convenes on Monday. Uh, there is going to be a prayer service at the Cathedral of St. Philip, one of the prettiest buildings on Peachtree Street, or Peachtree Road, rather. Uh, there will be a prayer service at 10 a.m. Then the swearing-in ceremony is going to be at the McCamish Pavilion on Georgia Tech's campus. It will start at 2 o'clock. Uh, then Brian Kemp will review the troops at 4.30 p.m. Uh, at Liberty Plaza at the Capitol. Uh, big day for him. There will be the the gala. It'll be the inaugural ball, essentially. It's not going to happen that night. That is going to happen Thursday night. Uh, I believe it's Thursday night. Um, a big deal. A new governor. We've had uh, Nathan Deal for eight years. He will head to UGA and teach after Monday. Um, but So Kemp, the legislature, all the statewide officers, they will be sworn in on Monday. And Kemp will start his four-year term. He's continuing to tour the state over these next couple of days in the run-up to Monday, uh, doing thank-you tours to the voters in those areas. Uh, the media, may, I say the media, and here I am doing it as well. Well, the media is, is enjoying pointing out he's ignoring Metro Atlanta. You know, here's the thing, though. Whether Stacey Abrams runs against him in four years or not, Brian Kemp has four years to to establish himself as his own man. There are a lot of people out there on the left who rejected Brian Kemp. Well, I shouldn't say on the left. There are a lot of independent voters in the suburbs, men and women, who rejected Brian Kemp because they didn't like the way he campaigned. They thought he campaigned too much as a Trump person. You can like Donald Trump and you can like Brian Kemp's campaigns. I like Brian Kemp's campaign. I thought the ads were witty. I thought they were funny. I thought they were memorable. I thought they made him stood out. But there were a lot of people who didn't. And those people voted for Stacey Abrams. Brian Kemp has four years now. He's got four years to show himself as his own man. He's got four years to prove he's competent. Four years to prove he's a capable governor. Four years to show the suburbs he's not going to drive the state into the ditch. Four years to prove them wrong. And I think he's going to do it. I think Brian Kemp is going to be a very good governor. Do I think conservatives will have disappointments? Yes. Conservatives are going to have disappointments even with Brian Kemp. Because conservatives have disappointments with everyone, so do progressives. Sometimes Brian Kemp will do something that isn't doesn't go as far enough. As conservatives think it should think he should be, we'll have to have the the good grace to have grace. Sometimes he's got to do what he's got to do because he's governor and he knows more or sees things differently than you or me. But I think he's going to be a good governor. I think for the last eight years, conservatives have liked Nathan Deal. They've respected Nathan Deal. A lot of them didn't vote for him the first time. I'm one of them. Uh, and they were impressed with prison reform. They were impressed with his education reforms. Uh, they feel betrayed on the religious liberty issue. I, I think that Brian Kemp will give conservatives some of the things they have wanted. Speaker Ralston will be an impediment. I think Brian Kemp will learn the diplomatic skills necessary to do an in-run around the speaker, at least, I hope. I don't expect to get everything I would love to get, but I expect that Brian Kemp will be very good for conservatives. More importantly, Brian Kemp will be elected as the first governor since Reconstruction who's been a Republican the whole time, who didn't have a party switch. That, I think, is pretty significant. This, this will be the first time we have a Republican becoming governor who actually looks at things from a long-held Republican position. He didn't just change because the voters changed. Uh, he, he's been a Republican the whole time. And I appreciate that. 
I think there will be a lot about what Nathan Deal did as governor that I hope Brian Kemp carries on, particularly education reform, criminal justice reform. Uh, and I hope that Brian Kemp is a little more willing to look at Republicans and conservatives and say, you know what, I realize you're concerned on these issues and we'll give you some wins even if the speaker doesn't like them. It's going to be a very interesting four years. But again, overall, I think this is very important. There are a lot of people who did not vote for Brian Kemp in 2018 because they thought he was going to be a Trump junior. They don't know Brian Kemp and they're going to have four years to get to know the Brian Kemp. I know. And in four years, I think his margins will improve for reelection. It is 25 after the hour. The phone number is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Um, so I want to ask, uh, I know I have the, the smartest, greatest listeners on the planet, uh, and I mean that sincere, sincerely. The, the amount of times I've asked questions and gotten answers from people, I, I actually want to ask input because I assume some of you have done this. And you can email me. Don't please don't don't call. Don't bother the call screener with this. Um, just shoot me an email, Eric, E R I C K at the Resurgent dot com. Christy and I, one of the things we want to do this year, I I, I don't like doing New Year's resolutions um, because you miss the new year and then suddenly you can procrastinate and say, hey, wait, uh, now I got to wait wait eleven months because I missed the new year to do it. I just you know you want to do a new resolution, start a resolution. You want to improve something, improve something. Uh, but Christian, I have been talking for the last couple of months. And one of the things that we wanted to improve is really getting better about budgeting, um, largely because um, one of the things that I have realized is that uh, we have a lot of recurring payments or we buy small things and, you know, we can get a better deal elsewhere. And you get into a habit, you don't shop around uh, and want to do that. And one of the things we decided we wanted to do is is do the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University um, and we've, we've had a lot of friends who have said very good things about it. I think we're going to do that. In fact, we're going to have dinner tonight with some friends who have gone through it, um, and just get a sense from them. But if any of y'all have gone through it and have any thoughts on it, feel free to email me, eric at the I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I used to be really, really good at balancing my checkbook every day and budgeting. Um, and then just kind of fell away from it and want to get back to it. Um, know where every penny is gone. And if, if only to be a little more generous, uh, instead of wasting money and then not being able to be more generous, not being able to, to give more to charity and stuff, uh, kind of, kind of means a lot to me to be able to tithe and everything and just want to be able to know where all the money is going and whatnot. Uh, so if you've gone through it, let me know. Uh, when we come back, there is more news out there that I think we need to spend some time with, uh, and that is, in particular, Delta. Delta has put out a video uh, on human trafficking. It's showing on its airplanes, and I'm going to play it for you when we come back. Uh, human trafficking is a huge issue to me. When I ran for city council in Macon uh, and was elected, the only issue I ran on was the human trafficking issue we had in middle Georgia at the time. It was a huge issue. And I resigned uh, because of this job, but WSB was kind enough to let me continue on until I got my legislation passed. And it's a huge issue. It is an issue that doesn't get a lot of attention because it's an awkward one. People don't like to talk about it, but I want to play you the Delta video and commend them for doing it when we come back. Welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Uh, can I just say one of the most annoying things on um, the internet, particularly on social media, is the willingness of people to declare themselves experts. I, I, I shouldn't be stunned at, but I actually am. The number of people who brazenly pretend they're experts on the National Emergencies Act because they probably would have read a Wikipedia entry or something. Uh, it's ludicrous. Um, I want to commend Delta Airlines for preparing a human trafficking campaign 
to air on their airplanes. Um, Human Trafficking Awareness Day is today, which, by the way, uh, I hesitate whether even to say it or not. But um, so today is my eighth anniversary on WSB. I actually started, uh, if you will remember, eight years ago. Uh, there was, that would have been what 2011. There was that big ice storm that came through, and I had to sleep on the floor one night. I couldn't get back to Macon, um, and I was up in Atlanta for three or four days. Couldn't get home. Christy and the kids were stuck at home. I was stuck up here. At one point, I had to sleep at the office because I couldn't even get a hotel room, and the phone lines were out. So it was just me talking for three hours a night, uh, nine to midnight at the time. And then Herman left, Herman Cain left to run for president. I moved into his slot and within a year was uh, five to seven and had been there ever since for basically seven years, five to seven. And now as of last week now, four to six. So in any event, that's a total distraction from the point I was going to make. Um, Delta is going to play this video on its airplanes and elsewhere to raise awareness on this issue. It is an issue I deeply care about. Uh, I really, really do. And I'm glad they're doing this. They need to be commended for it. I want to play you this video that Delta has put out. Um, just they've done a really good job. Hey. Hey. My uncle will get mad if he hears me talking to you. He's not really my uncle. That's just what he told me to say. He says I'm worth a lot, but he still won't buy me any clothes that fit. Or any clothes, really. All I have is what I'm wearing. He says I'll have everything I need when we get to where we're going. I just hope that wherever we're going is better than where I was. We had to work all the time and we never got to eat or sleep. It was worse for the girls. I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen or how to get out, but I can't say anything. I need you to do it for me. If you see signs of human trafficking, text HELP to be free. It's not just a message. It's an opportunity to save a life. At Delta, we've trained over 56,000 of our employees to recognize the signs of human trafficking. But we need your help. They do. It's a huge issue. It's an issue people aren't educated on. And thank you, Delta, for helping educate people on this. I encourage you to go to Delta's website and you can see the video for yourself. It is It's somewhat surreal. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to have this this human trafficking issue crop up today. Literally, um, I started my show January 11th in 2011, and I was an elected city councilman, and one of the conditions of taking this job was I needed to resign my position. I wasn't planning on running for office again anyway, so it didn't matter, but um, the company didn't... The FCC would have given us a, a very hard time, me being an elected official and having a radio show within listening range of where I was an elected official. And, I mean, it was it was a no-brainer. Um, take a job that meets once every other Tuesday or have a full-time job um, that that certainly paid me more than the job that I had at the time. And so I took it, uh, totally by accident as well. I would have never been on radio had a guy not gotten arrested in a drug raid in, in Macon and um, the president of Cox Media Group heard me on the radio filling in for the guy and offered me the job up here, assuming I had a job in radio when I really didn't. Uh, <laughs> it was just, it was all very, some people say fortuitous, I say providential, uh, God's hand in everything. And, but the WSB was very, very gracious. Cox was very gracious in allowing me to stay on council until I got legislation passed to fight human trafficking in Macon. It was the reason I got elected. Uh, driving at night, realizing that there were lots of shuttered storefronts 
that were coming alive at night. They were all Asian-themed massage parlors. And when I started researching, it turned out how many uh, were potentially fronts for human trafficking. And of all things, the way we realized we could fight back was just basic business regulation, uh, sanity, san- sanity, san- sanitary regulations and whatnot, making them have light bulbs that worked, keeping logs of the visitors, went to all the legitimate spas in town and said, how do you do business? And the local businesses helped come up with the, the way to do it. For example, you can't sleep in the premises. You have to have light bulbs in all the rooms that actually work, things like that. It was amazing how these businesses, uh, once they had to actually operate as a legit business, shuttered and the people disappeared. It was, just, it was an amazing thing. Human trafficking is a huge issue. It is an issue in your neighborhood, and you don't even know it. And all of us should be educated on the issue. Just a reminder that Mark Aram is up next, but at 7 o'clock, Clark Howard is going to be here to give you guys an update on all of the latest news that came out of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. There's a ton of stuff that came out, some really cool technology uh, unveiled this year. One of the things I'm interested in is Apple now embedding its uh, Apple TV service in smart TVs. I, I've got several of the Apple TV boxes, and... They're going to embed access to iTunes in the smart TVs. Of course, that company is transitioning, trying to be a services company, not just a hardware software company. And that'll be interesting to see and listen to Clark Howard talk about. Before we get out of here, I I just I got to commend Jim Acosta. I know conservatives don't like Jim Acosta a lot. Uh, they think he's a grandstander. Some of his colleagues at CNN complain about him more than than the president complains about him. But I, I really, I think we all need to tip our hat to Jim Acosta, who went down to South Texas and pointed out that where there is a border wall, there is no crisis. And went to an area where the border wall turns into a chain link fence and noted that people see illegal aliens crossing the border there. But where there's a wall, people don't cross. He says it's perfectly safe and people don't feel threatened. And I know he was trying to undermine the president on this, but he built the president's case. The president wound up thanking him at the White House today for doing such a good job showing that where there's a wall, there is no crisis. Uh, The president needs to stand strong on the shutdown and campaign on it. Have a good weekend.